with that, I'd ask you please to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 19. We continue this morning in our study through the Gospel of John. John chapter 19, we're going to begin at verse 31. Let me just paint the briefest of pictures where we left off last time in the Gospel of John. The last time we spent time together in this Gospel, Jesus had died on the cross. This unbelievable innocent man, the perfect man, the sinless man, in this great miscarriage of justice was sent to die for a crime that he never committed. But while he was on that cross, he paid for our sins. That the holy judgment of God the Father was poured out upon him as a substitute, as an innocent victim. And he received the punishment that we deserve. But when that work was finished, as the Gospel of John says, when all things were accomplished, when the work was finished and the price was paid, he cried out with that great voice, it is finished, to tell us die, paid in full. And then he yielded his spirit unto his God and Father, and his physical life ended. And there he is on the cross, still affixed to it by cruel nails. And then we pick it up here now at verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. Now notice what it says there in verse 31, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Normally, those who were crucified remained on the cross for days as a very grim warning to everybody who might oppose the authority of Rome. Yet because Sabbath was approaching, and it was a particularly high Sabbath because of its association with the Passover, because Sabbath was approaching... The religious leaders demanded that the Romans take away the three bodies that were affixed to these three crosses. Well, the last things that the Romans wanted to do was take a body off the cross when it wasn't dead. And so they had to make arrangements that the bodies would be thoroughly confirmed as dead. And so verse 31 says that the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. This was a normal practice. They even had a particular name for it where a soldier would come along with a heavy club or maybe even an iron bar and he would come up to the crucified victim there on the cross and they would come and break their legs. And the reason why this hastened the death of the crucified one was because to to get a proper breath as you were on a cross, you kind of had to support yourself a little bit from your legs. Now, of course, it was very painful because it would make the, 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 the wound of the, the, the feet that was affixed by the nails even worse, but, but, but you kind of lifted yourself up a little bit by your legs. If your legs were broken, you couldn't do that anymore, and basically, you, well, you, you suffocated. You drowned there on the cross. And so this is what happened. Notice what it says there in verse 32. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other. Friends, this is brutal work. You've got to be a tough, heartless guy as a Roman soldier to come up to a man who's already in the agony of crucifixion on the cross. You come up with a wooden club, you look at him, and he looks at you. And there's fear and terror in his eyes. You're going to strike me with a club and break my legs. And you whack him. You hear the bones break. Instantly the body slumps and he begins to gasp for breath. And you know, he's going to die in just a minute or two. Now think of the scene, ladies and gentlemen. The soldier comes along with the club. He looks at the one man. He hits him. He begins to wheeze and labor in his breath. And then for some reason, for some reason, he skips over the man in the middle. And he goes over to the next one. And he does the same thing. The poor eyes of the man looking down upon him. By the way, it just just reminds me. The one thief on the side of Jesus who believed, he was saved. But his agony was not over. 
It's not like uh, trusting in Jesus made everything in his life easier. No, he still had much to endure before he passed from this life to the next. But he did go into paradise with Jesus on that very day. So he did the one, passed over the middle, came to the third, now verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. They came to Jesus, and this is why he passed them by. He hits the first one. He looks at Jesus, and he goes, you know, that guy's eyes aren't open. He's not looking down at me with terror at having his legs about to be broken. He looks like he's already dead. Let's skip over to him because he's obviously alive. You break his legs, and then you come back to the middle guy and go, what are we going to do about him? Is he really dead or not? And notice it says there in verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. He goes, listen, I don't know if he's dead for sure. Let's find out. Let's poke him with a spear. So he draws out his spear. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, from archaeology and history, we've got a pretty good idea what Romans carried for their armament. And one of the things that the normal Roman soldier carried was a spear, and the head of the spear was basically about this wide, about a hand breadth wide at its largest point. Of course, it was a spear. It kind of angled into a point. But he took that spear that was about a hand breadth wide, and he poked it in all the way. How do we know he poked it in all the way? Because later, Thomas puts his whole hand in the wound that's in Jesus' side. That's how big it was. So he comes and he pierces the side of Jesus. And notice what happens there when he pierced the side of Jesus. It says in verse 34 that immediately blood and water came out. Now, the one thing that John takes us as is an absolute confirmation that Jesus was dead. This would not happen unless Jesus was dead. He was dead on the cross. No doubt about it. I, I don't mean to give a spoiler or anything, but he's going to rise from the dead. We'll cover that a little bit later. Now, the fact that he rise, rose from the dead disturbs some people, and they want to explain it away. And one of the most popular ways that people attempt, they don't succeed, but they attempt to explain away the resurrection of Jesus is they say he never really died. Ladies and gentlemen, the scriptures tell us very plainly that Jesus was genuinely dead. The soldier poked the sword deep into the body of Jesus, and out of his side flowed forth blood and water. And this was remarkable to John. That's why John indicates it. Now look, I, I know sometimes the, 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 the most foolish thing for a preacher to do is to speak outside of his expertise. I'm not a medical doctor. I, I, I don't know a whole lot about medicine. But apparently, around the heart is like a sack filled with a watery substance. What do they call it? The pericardium or something like that? And what many people believe is that this is evidence not just that Jesus was dead, but it could have been sort of an informal autopsy of how he physically died. Because apparently, when the heart is ruptured and that sack fills with blood, the watery substance that's normally in there is kind of filled and combined with a bloody substance, but something in the way that oil and water don't mix, the blood and the water don't really mix, so that if you pierced it, you could have a flow that looked something like water and something like blood come out of the wound. John noted that. And there are people that take this, we can't say it with certainty, but there are people who take this and say, you can say that the physical reason that Jesus died was of a ruptured heart. He died of a broken heart over the sin of humanity. But there he is, confirmed absolutely as dead. There was no doubt about it. Now verse 35. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Ladies and gentlemen, there was something about what happened in that scene that John saw. He said, I saw this and I know that it's true. And when I saw the blood and the water come forth, it confirmed to me more than ever that it's true and that you must believe. 
Isn't that a beautiful thing? Jesus really died for the sins of humanity. He died of that broken heart, if you could say that. He died as a substitute, a sinless substitute. He died giving life to humanity. Some people say, and it's perhaps true, that here what we have is we have a completion of an illustration. You know, Adam fell asleep, and out of the sleeping Adam, Eve came out of his side. You could say that, so to speak. Jesus was asleep on the cross, and out of the wound of his side comes forth every redeemed man and woman afterwards. They are saved by the blood of his sacrifice, by the washing of the water of the word. It expressed it so powerfully and in in such a powerful way to John that he says, you may believe this. This is true. You can believe the manner and the certainty of the death of Jesus. It's an essential part of our belief. We see that this happened and we note, verse 36, that these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. You see, it's amazing, friends. What seemed to be a random act by an anonymous soldier ended up fulfilling a holy promise of God that was uttered centuries before. You could say, well, why did the Roman soldier pass by and not break the bones of Jesus? You could say, well, he saw that he was already dead and he decided not to. Or you could say because it was prophesied hundreds of years before that he would do that. And the two prophecies that are mentioned are described there. Psalm 34, verse 20 says that those prophecies were fulfilled that not a bone of his would be broken. And then in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it was fulfilled so that you would believe where it said that he would be pierced. Matter of fact, it says of the Jewish people that they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Ladies and gentlemen, These things did not happen by accident. God was guiding every event. God was in control of all of this. And I can't help but think that even in the darkness and the despair of that moment, this was an encouragement to John. If he perceived it, as he saw it there on the cross, he could say, God is still in control. God is still working in the midst of this. The Messiah seems dead. All my hopes seem crushed. But somehow I can believe that God is in the midst of all of it. But then we come to verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as is the custom of the Jews, is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. The soldier pierces the side of Jesus. Blood and water comes out. Everybody knows the soldiers, the centurion who was supervising, they go, he's dead. There's no doubt about it. He's dead. So we got all three of them dead. They can be taken down from the cross. The other two were taken down and thrown into some common pit. They were thrown, I don't mean to sound disgraceful, they were thrown into the garbage dump. That could not happen to Jesus. A wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea came along. Verse 38 says, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, he and another man, another influential man named Nicodemus, they came and asked Pilate, verse 38, if they might take away the body of Jesus. And again, as I said before, normally the Romans would leave the bodies up on the cross until they were just a a horrific mess. But now in this situation, it was allowed that the body be taken down from the cross. As the body's taken down from the cross, it was the job of these two men who had been secret disciples, Joseph and Nicodemus, to do the work. Look at what it says there in verse 40. Then they took the body 
of Jesus. The implication from all four Gospels, which all speak of this event, the implication is that Joseph and Nicodemus did this themselves. They were wealthy men. They had servants. That they could have said, servant, go do this. They knew that they could not do that. They knew that they, as disciples and believers in Jesus, they must do this horrific work themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, can you just think of what that would have been like? An iron spike is driven through the wrist into the wood. You need some kind of tool to remove it. You've got to get a bar or a tool or a plier. You pull it out, and the body has to slump over the shoulder of a man who's bringing it down. And there's blood and filth everywhere. They remove the spikes that take the body away. Now, fortunately, as we're going to read in a few moments, the tomb was very close to where the cross was. So they take the body down. It's slumped over his shoulder. And as lovingly as possible, they come and they lay it out on some kind of table or platform where they can perform the burial. And what was the burial like? Look at verse 40. It tells you. They bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as is the custom of the Jews is to bury. Joseph and Nicodemus did what they could to wrap the body. They took these strips of linen, and they would kind of coat them on both sides with these sort of sticky spices. And the purpose of the spices was sort of to delay decomposition and to cover over the terrible smell of decomposition. They they weren't trying to mummify the body. No, that was a thing that the Egyptians did. No, they, they would just take the body, they would cover it very lovingly, very carefully, bind it up, cover it in what they had, and then they would put it within the tomb. That's what they did. But I don't want you to notice a phrase, or I don't want you to forget a phrase there. It says there in verse 40 that they did it, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And the Jewish people to this day, even into ancient times, have very definite customs to what you do with the body before you bury it. I know it says that they wrapped it in the strips of linen and all that, but the custom of the Jews is to do something before the body. you got to lay it out, and you got to take out any foreign object that's embedded in the body. And then you have to wash it clean of the dirt, of the dried blood, of the filth that remains on the body. And can you even imagine what that was like for Joseph and Nicodemus to do it? You start at the head. There's a crown of thorns upon that head. You remove it, and certainly some of those thorns are embedded in the scalp. And you have to gently search through and pull them out. You have to wash the face that has been bloodied. You have to go, and, you have to go and, and take the pieces of beard that have been torn out and wash the bloody stain. You work yourself down. You come to the shoulders. They're filled with splinters from the cross. You wash the wounds on the arms. You dry away all the caked blood. You come to the thing on the side. What do you do with that? They poured over and washed as tenderly as a baby is washed by its mother, these two rich men washed the body of the Messiah. I cannot imagine that they could do any of that work with a dry eye. Can you imagine how they're weeping during the whole thing? Can you imagine that they're just wondering, Jesus, could you wake up? Jesus, are you really dead? You know those people who like to say that maybe Jesus didn't die on the cross and that's how they try to explain the resurrection? Try telling that to Joseph of Arimathea or to Nicodemus. They'd punch you in the face. I know what a dead body's like, they'd say. We carefully prepared that body for burial according to the custom of the Jews. We know that he was dead. We prayed that he would wake up, but he was dead. We know it. And as they did this, 
these men who were experts in the law, they must have known that they were fulfilling prophecy at the time. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 says this, that the Messiah would be with the rich at his death. And here's the body of Jesus. As it was at the hands of two rich men, not their servants, but Joseph and Nicodemus, they did this work, and they're thinking, this fulfills prophecy, this fulfills prophecy. Here he is with the rich at his death. And this was strange work for these two men to do. But it was also strange that in the plan of the Godhood, Jesus would passively submit to it. Friends, I don't understand everything about how Jesus did what he did with his humanity and his deity together, but I know that on some level, Jesus agreed to this. I know you say, how can a dead man agree to anything? But Jesus agreed to it in the plan of God before it ever happened. Now, Jesus would agree to this? Why? Why would he agree to such a thing? I, I imagine in my mind that it could have happened differently. Why couldn't Jesus dead and expired on the cross why couldn't he raise from the dead right from the cross that would have been cool you know like a superhero in a blaze of light and radiated glory right from the cross the nails pop out the wounds you know heal themselves he comes down from the cross and he goes who's in charge now I mean would have made it any less precious the atonement was still would have been offered. He still would have raised from the dead. Why did he submit to this burial, this burial where he's treated? And forgive me for using this illustration, but I think it fits. He's treated like a very old man or woman in their advanced years who has to be tenderly cared for by their children and washed and cared for in ways that they never imagined themselves doing. Jesus, why did you submit to this? Why did you agree to this? Well, listen, God's plan made this burial of Jesus so important that it is said to be one of the essential components of the gospel itself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul lays out the essential components of the gospel, he says, this is the gospel that I preach to you, that Jesus was buried, that, or excuse me, that he died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why throw in the burial? Matter of fact, it reflects back in our ancient Christian creeds. In the Apostles' Creed, it begins like this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. This burial of Jesus is important. I think one reason it's important is because it fulfills the Scripture. You remember that passage? We just put it on the screen a moment ago. It said in that passage that they made his grave with the wicked. It meant to say that the Messiah would be buried in a grave, and he was. It also fulfilled the promise that Jesus made during his life. Jesus said that he would be put in the earth, even as Jonah was put in the belly of the whales, that he would be buried away for three days. And so he was. It fulfilled his own promise. I think the burial was also important because it demonstrated beyond any doubt that Jesus was dead. As I said before several times, this is absolute evidence that Jesus was in fact dead. His physical life had expired. No doubt about that. The burial also gave Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus a way to proclaim their relationship. Isn't it interesting that both those men to some extent were secret disciples until this? And I think God, God has something wonderful to say to secret disciples. Are you a secret disciple of Jesus? Well, first of all, let me say, I'm glad you're a disciple. I'd rather you be a secret disciple than no disciple. But don't you believe that it's God's will for you to move out of the secrecy of your discipleship? And who knows how God may engineer for that to happen. He had a specific way for it to happen for Joseph and for Nicodemus. I also consider it this way, that when Jesus was buried, it was his last rung 
down on the ladder leading from heaven. I don't want to get away from myself, but the next time we're in the Gospel of John, friends, it's nothing but glory. You know, this is as low as it goes, and it goes pretty low, but this is it. There's a bottom to this, and the burial is the bottom. Everything now is up. This was the last rung down on the journey from heaven. Finally, I'd say this. The burial is important because it's just another way that Jesus identified with his people. He's connecting with the humility of man. Friends, listen. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a transaction aspect to what he did. He took my sins, I take his righteousness. And the same for all who believe. There's a transaction aspect, and that's very important. But there's another aspect that's just an identification aspect. He is identifying with weak and sinful humanity. Unless Jesus comes for us first, which I say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But unless Jesus comes for us first, we're all going to die And in some way or another, we're all going to be buried. Jesus says, I want to enter into the experience of humanity so closely, so intimately, that not only will I die, I will be buried. I will submit to having my body treated as if I were a child, as if I'm being washed all over again so that I can experience just what my people experience. Because if I experience everything my people experience, then they can experience what I experience. There is a promise, if we will see it in here, of resurrection to come. I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's for next time. But maybe we leave it here at verse 41. It speaks of the garden tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Matthew chapter 27, verse 60 tells us that this tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea himself. John doesn't tell us that, but Matthew does. And a rich man like Joseph would purchase this tomb in a beautiful garden area, and it would have been carved out of or sort of made like a shaft into solid rock itself. They get out the chisels, and they just start chiseling, and they carve out a little room, and then a side room within this little tomb. And it's the kind of thing that a circular stone is rolled over the cover of it, and that's how the body is secured. So they put Jesus in the tomb after their heart had gone out and broken over the burial. It's just a short distance from the cross. Then I'm supposing, it doesn't say, I'll just say it, but it's, I'm supposing that they watch there as the stone is rolled over the entrance to the tomb. It's secured. They put a seal over the stone to make sure that nobody tampers with it. As a matter of fact, they see the Roman guards come to protect the tomb. There's Roman guards stationed outside and a seal placed right outside the tomb so that nobody messes with that tomb. They did this at the request of the religious leaders because the religious leaders said, you know, that guy said he was going to rise from the dead and we don't have anybody stealing the body. Well, friends, nobody was going to steal the body. But they secured the tomb and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went their way. And they left that garden where Jesus was buried. You could say this, that the human race was ruined in a garden. Were we not? The Garden of Eden where Adam, a sinless man, disobeyed God. And he was responsible for the fall of the entire human race. We're all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. But when man failed in the first garden, God didn't give man a second chance. Isn't that what we always want? Oh, give me a second chance. Just give me a second chance. Listen, friends, you know what God knows about us in our fallen humanity? In our fallen humanity, you give me a second chance, and I'll blow the second chance, too. God knew that I needed more than a second chance, so you know what he sent? He sent a second Adam. 
a second Adam who came into another garden. He came into the garden of Gethsemane. And where in the first garden, Adam said, I will. In the second garden, Jesus said, your will be done. And he laid down his life as a perfect sacrifice, going from Gethsemane to Calvary, now to the tomb. And we leave it all in the garden of the first tomb with the lifeless body of Jesus there laid in the tomb. Whatever will happen next, I guess we'll have to wait for the next time we get into the Gospel of John. The Redeemer's body lay lifeless in a tomb, in a garden, but you and I know the story is not over. It is not over. And so when something seems dead, when something is buried, you and I know that the story is not finished. It's just about to get to its very, very best point. Friends, I just think that we stop and we pause and we say, do you believe it? Can you say, yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe that Jesus died as my substitute. Forget about everybody else around you. Yeah, I know they got a lot of problems too, and they need Jesus too, but forget about them. What about you? He died for you. He was buried for you. And he's going to rise again from the dead for you. If you can say, yes, Jesus, I need this. I believe in it. I want it to dominate my life. Then you're right where God wants you to be. If you're not there yet, what's stopping you? Come now today. And a great opportunity is here because this morning, we often do it on the first Sunday of the month. It's not like a law or ritual or anything, but we just often do it on the first Sunday of the month. We're going to receive communion together. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. The worship team's going to come back out. The ushers will come forward. And they'll be ready to hand out trays with a piece of bread and a cup. The bread will come first. Take that piece of bread and hold on to it. Now, if you are consciously rejecting Jesus Christ, it's best if you let the bread pass by. Nobody's going to know it. It's not to call you out or mark you in our midst. But why consciously reject Jesus? Why don't you surrender your life to him right now? You could just pray and do it. And say, Jesus, if you would love me so much that you would be buried for me, then Lord Jesus, I want to give my life to you and I want to receive your life. Father in heaven, I pray this morning that as we as such a blessed congregation come together now to your holy table that we would take the truth of that body of Jesus that was broken on the cross of that blood that was poured out as a substitute for us that he died a death he didn't deserve so that we could live a life we didn't deserve Jesus we ask that now in a way that's both spiritual and material, you would connect us with that life through the receiving of the body, receiving of the bread, the receiving of the cup. We trust in you, Jesus. We do so now in Jesus' name. Amen.